Tonight, the end of Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court overturning the once landmark ruling after nearly half a century. The scenes of celebration and heartbreak in Washington today after the Supreme Court's conservative majority ruled abortion is not a constitutional right. The decision ending federal protection and handing the choice to states. Abortion now already illegal in parts of the country, with nearly half of all states preparing to ban or restrict the procedure. Will other Supreme Court decisions, including those on contraception, be overturned? Pete Williams and Chuck Todd are here. A nation divided, President Biden calling it, quote, a sad day for this country, while urging Congress to take action to protect abortion rights. Other Democrats, including House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senator Joe Manchin, also slamming the decision and suggesting Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch lied during their confirmation hearings. Meanwhile, on the Republican side, former President Trump celebrating the ruling as a, quote, win for life and taking credit for it while former Vice President Pence called for a national abortion ban. Tonight, people on both sides of this debate, including an abortion provider, join Top Story Live. Also breaking tonight, the House passing the most sweeping gun control legislation in three decades. The landmark bill now heads to the president's desk. How soon will the changes take effect? And the one-on-one -on -one interview with Ukrainian President Zelensky, what he told our Richard Engel about the American soldiers captured by Russia. Top Story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Gabe Gutierrez, in for Tom. Tonight, that landmark Supreme Court decision. Some abortion providers already forced to turn patients away after the high court overturned Roe v. Wade after nearly 50 years. The five to four decision ending federal protections for abortion and leaving the decision to states. Three of the affirming justices appointed by former President Trump. Roughly half of the states are expected to ban abortion, several already activating trigger laws, immediately making the procedure illegal, with some exceptions. Following the ruling, abortion rights opponents cheering and celebrating outside. But tonight, a live look at the Supreme Court, where demonstrators have been gathering all day. The reaction from lawmakers also split. President Biden slamming the decision, but saying, quote, Roe is on the ballot, urging Americans to vote in the midterms and also calling on Congress to act. We have a lot to get to tonight, so let's get right to Pete Williams, who leads us off from Washington. Outside the court, now ringed with a security fence, opponents of abortion rights cheered. Complete and utter joy that it was finally overturned, but the determination, a steely determination that the battle is not over. Legal abortion on demand! Legal abortion! For others, it was what they were dreading ever since the court signaled in December it was likely to overturn Roe. It feels like a betrayal. It feels like my country doesn't love me and appreciate my body as a woman. The court overturned nearly 50 years of abortion precedence in a ruling that was a first. Never before has the court granted and then taken away a widely recognized constitutional right. The court voted five to four to overturn Roe. Chief Justice John Roberts said going that far wasn't necessary to uphold Mississippi's law banning abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. The court voted six to three to uphold that law. The majority opinion overturning Roe tracked closely with the version that leaked in May, touching off nationwide protest, including at the homes of some of the court's conservatives. Justice Samuel Alito's majority opinion said no right to abortion is protected by any constitutional provision. The Roe decision, he said, was egregiously wrong and deeply damaging. Like Winston Churchill said, this is the end of the beginning. Um, it's been a 50-year battle to protect unborn children, uh, but we now have those battles in every state. Unlike other court rulings based on a right to privacy, Alito said abortion is different because it involves a potential life. So he said the ruling does not undermine the rights to same-sex marriage or contraception, though Justice Clarence Thomas said the court should take another look at them too. The ruling does not make abortion illegal, but it's no longer a constitutional right, so that leaves the issue up to each state. It's likely to become illegal soon in about half the nation. Some states have already banned it as of tonight. The rest of the banned states are likely to follow in the coming weeks. Justice Brett Kavanaugh, in a controlling concurrence, said states that ban abortion cannot make it a crime for their residents to travel to a state where abortion is legal to get the procedure. 
In a joint dissent, Justices Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan said the court ruling means that from the very moment of fertilization, a woman has no rights to speak of. They say a state can force her to bring a pregnancy to term, even at the steepest personal and family cost. People are going to be heading to the streets, both in the wake of this decision immediately and in the days and months to come, and making clear that the majority of people in the United States support abortion rights. And Pete Williams joins us now live from Washington. Uh, Pete, I want to pick up on something in your report. You mentioned that Justice Kavanaugh seemed to indicate that he supports the constitutional right to travel to other states to get an abortion. Can you talk to me more about that? How different was that from his other conservative colleagues? Well, he's the only one who said that. And you, normally, you, you would say that was just a passing comment. But this is a five to four ruling to uphold Roe. So his vote was critical. That makes it the controlling decision. So when he says he believes there's a constitutional right to travel, I think that's as good as saying the Supreme Court has said that as well. Now, Pete, you have been standing outside that Supreme Court building for decades, and you see the demonstrators behind you. When you heard this decision come down this morning, just put it in perspective for me. How seismic was this decision in the history of the court? Well, as expected, it was seismic because of the historical nature of it, overturning a 50-year precedent, the first time the court has ever given an, uh, a right and then taken away that it's constant, that's widely accepted. You know, in a way, we knew this day was coming. Uh, it was pretty clear when the case was argued back in December the court was going to overturn Roe. Then we had that leaked version of the decision that came out in February. But still, it's still stunning when it actually happens. And this is the biggest crowd I've ever seen outside the Supreme Court after a decision, people celebrating and mourning the decision. And one other note here, Gabe, this now does return the issue to the states. But one thing the dissenters say today is that there's nothing in this ruling that would prevent Congress from banning abortion nationwide if it ever chose to do that. Pete Williams, live for us at the Supreme Court. Pete, thanks so much. Reaction is pouring in from across the country as the Supreme Court's decision was handed down. Tears of elation and frustration from protesters on either side of this issue. And as crowds took to the streets, trigger laws immediately took effect in several states. Some women suddenly unable to get abortions they had scheduled for today. NBC's Blaine Alexander is in Mississippi. Outside the Mississippi Clinic, at the heart of today's Supreme Court decision, we do abortion and we're proud to do abortion. Even though the days for that are now numbered, at the Jackson Women's Health Organization, the requests are only growing. In 10 days, because of the state's trigger law, Mississippi's only abortion clinic will shut down for good. I will tell you that any patient who contacts us, we'll see them. We'll make sure we see them during that 10 days. But in some states, change is already happening. Of the 13 trigger law states, abortion is now illegal, with a few exceptions in at least five of them following today's ruling, including Missouri, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, where, through tears, the attorney general signed the certification late today. Restoring to the state of Arkansas the authority to prohibit abortion. In Wisconsin, Planned Parenthood immediately stopped abortions following today's ruling. The medical director had to break the news to patients already in the waiting room. Today, I had to look people in the eye and turn them away when they were seeking abortions. Across the country, emotional reaction on both sides. My first reaction was rage. This is an amazing victory. And while some lawmakers celebrate the decision. This is a profound change in the law in our country and it will save millions of lives of unborn children. Others? My wife's in tears. My kids are incredibly distraught. My sister says I thought the courts were there to protect our freedoms, not roll them back. Back in Mississippi, today's ruling is a victory for Terry Herring. My eyes just filled with tears. This is a day to rejoice. She has spent nearly 30 years fighting to end abortion and says she's proud Mississippi Absolutely. played a role. What does today mean for you? You know, personally, um, you know, we didn't know if this would happen in our lifetime, right? We, we, we've been advocating for a long time. So seeing this happen in my lifetime and knowing that we had the opportunity to be a part of that is, um, a, a, it means us being a part of changing history. But for Tyler Harden, who runs Planned Parenthood in the state. You've gotten dozens of calls since this decision came down. Mm -hmm. Are women scared? 
Yes, and um, to be honest, I'm scared as well. The closest clinic, she says, you know, will be in Florida, a seven-hour drive. That means that people will have to find funds to travel. People will have to find funds to get hotel rooms, buy food. Is that a feasible option for them? It's not. Blaine Alexander joins us now live from Jackson, Mississippi. And Blaine, you touched on this at the end of your report, but travel is particularly difficult for many women in Mississippi. How huge of a hurdle is that going to be with this statewide abortion ban already taking effect? You know, Gabe, for many people, it will be an insurmountable, insurmountable hurdle. Consider this. Mississippi has the highest poverty rate of any state in the nation. It's a number that's especially high among black women, a group that many fear will be most impacted by today's decision. Now, in talking with activists on both sides of this, one place where they do agree, they say that the focus should be on getting women the resources that they need for a safe pregnancy and beyond. Gabe. Blaine Alexander, live for us in Mississippi. Blaine, thank you. President Biden condemned today's decision, declaring that Roe will be on the ballot in this fall's midterm elections, while conservative Republicans applauded the ruling. Peter Alexander has more from the White House. A somber President Biden tonight declaring this a low moment for the nation's highest court. It's a sad day for the court and for the country. Now, with Roe gone, let's be very clear. The health and life of women in this nation are now at risk. The White House mindful of how personal this ruling is, inviting more than a dozen senior aides, all women, to witness the president calling the decision the result of an extreme ideology. It was three justices named by one president, Donald Trump. Make no mistake, this decision is a culmination of a deliberate effort over decades to upset balance of our law. Top Republicans touting the ruling as a hard-won victory. The right to life has been vindicated. The voiceless will finally have a voice. It will save countless innocent children. Two prominent senators now suggest they were misled by assurances made during recent confirmation hearings. Roe v. Wade's an important precedent of the Supreme Court. A good judge will consider it as precedent of the United States Supreme Court Republican Susan Collins slamming today's decision as inconsistent with those justices' testimony. So what comes next? With his authority limited tonight, President Biden's calling on Congress to guarantee the right to an abortion. But Senate Democrats currently do not have the votes for that. The president vowing his administration will protect women's access to FDA-approved medications like abortion pills and contraception and promising to defend a woman's ability to travel to other states where abortion remains legal. 63% of Americans do not believe Roe should be overturned. Democrats, including the nation's first woman vice president, hoping to redirect that outrage to this fall's midterm elections. You have the final word. So this is not over. This fall, Roe is on the ballot. A defining cultural clash in a country now even more deeply divided. And Peter Alexander joins us now live from the White House. Peter, President Biden is also warning that the court's ruling could lead to other personal freedoms being rolled back. Yeah, Gabe, that's right. President Biden cited Justice Thomas's majority opinion that the right to contraception, same-sex relationships, same-sex marriage should all be reconsidered. President Biden, in his remarks today, argued the court is taking the country down what he called an extreme and dangerous path. Gabe. Peter Alexander, live for us at the White House. And for more on the political fallout of this decision, let's bring in NBC's political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd. So, Chuck, what does this decision mean for November for both Democrats and Republicans? Well, I think it does sort of give the Democratic um, sort of campaign apparatus a focus and 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 some structure and some uh, and an issue to start motivating the base. I mean. All of our polling had been indicating for months it was the Republicans that were more enthusiastic about voting um, uh, in November than the Democrats were. There's been a lot of reasons why there's Democratic demoralization. The economy is certainly one of them. There's disappointment that the Democrats haven't been able to get their agenda passed. There is this sense of, hey, you, you control all the levers of power. I think what we've seen here, this will supercharge, I think, turn out on the left. But don't underestimate the impact on both sides on this one. Gabe, I think what, what we're seeing is we're going to see another extraordinarily close and contentious national election. 
And that's the other thing is this is going to be a super nationalized election. It may feel like a more like a presidential um, than a typical midterm. You know, Chuck, I was watching your analysis earlier on an NBC News special report, and you mm -hmm. highlighted that you thought that the election of Donald Trump in 2016 really led to the shattering of stability in this country. Don't you mm -hmm. think that the forces had been Look, building before that and, yeah. you know, he simply harnessed it? Talk to me about that. Well, it's it. Look, I think you can we can always sit here and go back. And you can go, but when you look at sort of, that was a, that's a fork in the road mo moment for the country. And so I was putting it under also, I mean, this is, you know, you don't always know in the election that you have how consequential it's going to be. You don't always know what kind of impact where literally one decision, one different decision would have put you on a different path. We've had very few presidential elections that have done that. 1876 is one, literally. Uh, we they got, you know, Reconstruction ended. Um, it extended, essentially brought on the era of Jim Crow. It's one of, one of those elections that had it gone a different way. Um, we may have been in a different place on civil rights in this country a lot earlier in our nation's history. It, you just look at everything we're dealing with right now and all the fallout and his decisions, whether it's direct or indirect, and I throw the what we're learning in the January 6th hearings into this, we're just real, I mean, Donald Trump's election has had a, a a sort of an impact on our on the direction of this nation in ways that I don't think any of us thought was coming, and it's been absolutely consequential. And Chuck, picking up on that, you've covered a lot of politics over the years, mm -hmm. obviously. Do you, yeah. How do you think this decision will impact Washington the way we know it, the institutions of Washington? Well, boy, I, look, I, I think the the Supreme Court is the one that's taken the biggest hit. You know, we've already had the rest of our institutions had already been battered pretty badly, right? Congress has an approval rating that is in the single digits a lot of times, anywhere from being nine and twelve percent. Um, we we see, you know, we we now are our second straight president that we uh, don't like essentially as a country under forty percent. Um, we've already, you know, the distrust of those institutions has been there, but the, the Supreme Court gave. That was sort of like it was uh, it was it was keeping us together. It was the thread that was keeping us together. You know, they'd sit there and it, it almost looked like the Roberts court for a while really did zigzag a little bit, a little more liberal on social issues, a little more conservative on economic issues. And it seemed they seemed to st strike the balance. Right. This it was the Roberts court um, that that kept health care the Roberts court that uh, gave you same sex marriage. A and then. You know, we, we've 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 just you know now we're in 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 a in a direction that I think the Supreme Court's going to be seen as very politicized. I think because two of the last three were appointed under unusual circumstances that many people will say was unethical, wasn't illegal, but you know holding open the seat that Gorsuch got and then jamming uh, the quick uh, seat that the Amy Coney Barrett got, it's going to erode that trust. And Gabe, here's the worst part of all of this: you have a lot of Trump supporters who don't trust many institutions. That he tells them not to trust. Now you got a lot of people on the left don't trust this Supreme Court. It doesn't matter how we get there, but collectively, a majority of this country not trusting many aspects of the rule of law, that's not healthy for this republic. History unfolding before our, our eyes. Chuck Todd, moderator of Meet the Press. Chuck, thanks so much for joining us on Top Story. And while some all around the country are protesting this decision, anti-abortion groups are celebrating tonight. Mallory Carroll joins us now, and she's the Vice President of Communications at uh, the Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America. Mallory, what was your reaction to the decision today? Well, thank you so much for having me on this evening. And I would say, um, you know, we were overwhelmed with joy this morning to get this decision. It's a win for democracy. First off, um, you know, in 1973, in one day, seven unelected men said that they were going to settle this issue in the hearts and minds of the American people and in the law. And they struck down every single pro-life law that existed at that point at the state level. And they did the exact opposite of settle this in the hearts and minds of the American people, as we've seen from the culture wars that have ra raged for these last five decades. And so today we see this as for what it is. It's the court taking its them off the scale and allowing the American people through their elected representatives to pass laws that reflect their values. And this is what we're going to do is reuse the tools of democracy to debate and to find consensus at the state level and in Washington. And it's going to look different from state to state, but we have the opportunity now to modernize our laws um, 
Roe, the status quo under Roe uh, for these last 49 years has been abortion on demand up into the moment of birth. The Washington Post fact-checked our research arm a few years ago. The United States is one of seven countries because of our judicial, uh, because of our jurisprudence on this, alongside China and North Korea, one of seven countries in the world that allows abortion um, after the yeah. point the baby can feel pain all the way up to the moment of birth. So we're very encouraged and recognizing that our work is really just beginning. And Mallory, you mentioned finding consensus at the state level. How do you think that's possible at this point? This is such a divisive issue. I think it is possible. I mean, the, over the last 10 years, state legislatures have been passing protections for babies uh, who have Down syndrome, protections for babies after 20 and 15 weeks. Those laws have been uh, passed by duly elected state legislators that are responsible to the people who elected them, and they've been put under injunction um, by the courts because of Roe. So I think that what we're about to see, the actions that we're about to see lawmakers take, people who are are, again, elected by the people to the legislative branch of government, which is charged with setting law. Um, that is what consensus is going to look like. And if there's an overreach, if there's a, a, a law that goes too far, there's going to be a quick correction in the next election cycle. So um, I was very interested to hear the conversation with Chuck. Um, you, you know, we see this is going to be a, obviously a huge issue in the midterm elections, but the Democratic position is to not just codify Roe versus Wade, but we go beyond it. We're talking abortions performed by non-doctors, mm -hmm. paid for by taxpayers uh, throughout all nine months of pregnancy and preventing, again, lawmakers, future legislators in Congress and at the state level from passing pro-life legislation regardless of whether or not it's the will of the people. Um, that is an extreme position. And we go door to door talking to voters in battleground states. We've been doing this for the last uh, four election cycles, and we've been working um, towards the 2022 election cycle since last summer. And what we hear from voters, women in the suburbs, Hispanic voters, other minority voters, uh, people who consider themselves Democrat, they're oftentimes going to vote based on their support for another issue, whether it's climate change or something else that they care about. When we talk to them about the contrast that exists between the two sides on this issue, they are swayed to vote for the pro-life candidate in that election. And with all that our country is going through right now, with pocketbook issues being at the top of the list of what voters are caring about, I think we're going to see uh, some disappointment uh, for, from Democrats who are running, who are thinking that this is going to be the um, the saving, you know, the Hail Mary pass. Uh, Terry McAuliffe tried to do this in the Virginia gubernatorial race, make it all about abortion. He lost voters uh, who considered abortion their top issue by more than 20 points to um, the pro-life candidate and now our current governor, Glenn Youngkin. So this yeah. is a big issue, and the, the historically pro-life candidates um, benefit uh, on the on the winning have a winning margin. Mallory Carroll, thanks so much for joining us here on Top Story. Uh, Ma Mallory is the Vice President of Communications at the Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America organization. Thanks so much for joining us. But we want to turn to some breaking news now, uh, and we want to go to New York, where protests are starting to grow. Jesse Kirch joins us live from Washington Square Park. We see the live aerials of the park right now. Jesse, what are you seeing there right now? Hey, Gabe. So we're marching up from Washington Square Park. Uh, we were in New York's East Village, uh, and we are making our way uptown. There are thousands of people out here. You can hear there's uh, this is several groups that have converged here, uh, multiple organizations. You can see people have all kinds of different signs out here, chanting different things. Uh, I think one of the things that's notable, there were some people that started to be gathering in Washington Square Park as early as late morning, early afternoon, drawing in chalk, people coming by, adding their message in chalk. Uh, and the crowd has just grown throughout the day, and multiple groups converged at Washington Square Park and are now making their way uptown. I don't know if you can see it, but off in the distance is the World Trade Center, just to give people context. And we are heading for Union Square, so further uptown in Manhattan. I've asked people uh, multiple questions, but one of the things I was asking about is, do you think this makes a difference in the fall? Obviously, in the context of where we are, this is New York City in a state, in a city that is very much uh, supporting abortion rights. So this is not the place where those rights, in theory, are directly under threat right now. So there are a couple things that have motivated people to be out here tonight. Some people tell me they're here to express their support for women across this country. One woman was here with her young daughter who was up on her shoulders and, and looked at this as, as a symbolism for uh, rights for her daughter being taken away. 
more broadly. And there's also a message from some people here to be sending a message across the country to women in other states where they do not now have access to abortion rights, that they are supporting them even from here in New York City, Gabe. And Jesse, I see uh, some kids there in the crowd, uh, some entire families there, obviously very passionate uh, on this issue. Um, again, they're heading uptown, you said now. Uh, do you have any idea how long they plan to be out on the streets uh, throughout the night? Yeah, well, you know, frankly, this appears to be multiple organizations that have come together. There was a rally that was growing in Washington Square Park. We knew there was simultaneously another rally that was going on uptown, and a group appeared to make their way downtown and converge uh, on Washington Square Park, which is, of course, where that iconic arch is in lower Manhattan. So this, I, frankly, I don't know how far, how long this is going to go on. We believe the endpoint might be Union Square Park, which we're, we're just a couple blocks away from. Uh, and, you know, there are people who have been lining the streets, holding up signs, even if they're not marching with this group, people taking photos. Uh, but, th I mean, it is hard to get a full grip on the scale of the number of people in Washington Square Park by the end. They were uh, pouring out uh, of the north end of the park, and probably uh, much of it, we'd made our way through the park. And you can tell, uh, I mean, I'm looking back, Gabe, and this goes at least two, three, four city blocks, uh, and it's really hard to see how far down it might go. So a lot of people out here. Jesse Kirch, live for us in New York City. Jesse, thank you. For a closer look at today's decision and the future of the Supreme Court, I want to bring in Tom Goldstein. He's an NBC News contributor and the, contributor, rather, and the founder of the popular SCOTUS blog. It's a Supreme Court expert, of course. And Tom, surely we should adhere closely to the principles of judicial restraint here. But uh, where the broader path of the court chooses, um, you know, it, it's entailing repudi repudiating, I should say, a constitutional right we have not only previously recognized, but it also expressly reaffirmed applying uh, the doctrine of stare uh, decisis. So putting that in layman's terms, the Chief Justice is essentially saying the court went too far here, right, back in 1973? Well, what the Chief Justice is saying today is that he would have upheld Missouri's abortion restriction, would have allowed the state to say that you cannot have an abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy, but he would have not overruled Roe versus Wade, that he would have tried to chart a middle ground uh, narrowing Roe versus Wade further because it wasn't necessary to decide in this case whether to overturn that decision. And he criticized his five more conservative colleagues for going that much more dramatic step, overturning one of the foundational precedents that all Americans know. Um, and it's just a choice between uh, two different strands of conservatism of how aggressive they want to be. But make no mistake about it, there are six votes on the Supreme Court who think that Roe is wrongly decided, but only five to actually overturn it. And Tom, we've known about this six to three ideological balance of the court since Justice Coney Barrett was confirmed. But do you think this will reignite conversations about expanding the court? It probably will. Uh, you know, it's very interesting that all of us generally assume that because there are nine justices on the Supreme Court, there have to be under the Constitution. That's not true. There have been more, there have been less at different times. Congress decides how many justices there are. And theoretically, a Democratic Congress with a Democratic president could decide to make it 11, 13, 15 different members on the Supreme Court. But centrist Democrats inside the Senate are extremely unlikely to uh, approve that kind of measure, and that's been the barrier that they haven't been able to overcome. Now, today may change that calculus a little bit. They'd have to get rid of the filibuster and vote to increase the size of the Supreme Court. But in theory, they could go ahead and do it and reinstate Roe versus Wade. So in his concurring opinion, Justice Thomas named several other court uh, opinions which upheld the right to contraception um, and legalized gay marriage. Um, so. Is he essentially forecasting future targets here and opinions that the court uh, may hand down in the future? Well, he's definitely saying today, I want us to revisit those cases, the cases that say that you have a constitutional right to contraception, that you cannot criminalize sodomy, that there is a constitutional right to gay marriage. The majority response, his other co colleagues respond, you know, no, 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 no. We're not calling any of that into question. But it's, as the dissent says, it's a little hard to see how. The decision overruling Roe gets rid of a very, very foundational, long-accepted precedent in the law. 
it, and it does so on the ground that the right to abortion isn't long settled in the nation's history. Well, neither is a right to contraception, neither is a right to engage in homosexual conduct, and neither is a right to same-sex marriage. So it's going to be quite the needle that has to be uh, thread um, uh, in order for the conservatives to overturn this decision and not the others. But we're going to see those cases for the next 10 years, I'm sure. Tom Goldstein, thanks so much. As we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, abortion restrictions are likely to take effect in more than half the country. Some states where it will remain legal are anticipating an influx of patients who will travel to get the procedure. Some abortion providers are even relocating. Here's Stephanie Gosk with more. With the stroke of a pen, the Supreme Court has likely triggered a massive abortion migration in this country. More than 300,000 abortions were performed last year in the 26 states where the procedure could soon be illegal or highly restricted. Now those people may choose to cross state lines. In Tennessee, the attorney general wants the state's six-week ban to start right now. The people of Tennessee, for the first time in 50 years, will have a chance to uh, weigh in on this issue. So this is where we yeah. have, do our abortion procedures back here. The, these are your uh, uh, abortion, two abortion procedure rooms. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have two rooms. Yep. We recently visited the Choices Healthcare yeah, Clinic in Memphis. Soon the doors to these rooms will be closed for good. Our patients are predominantly black. Uh, the, the majority of them are uninsured or underinsured. They have been bracing for this court decision for months. We just kind of all thought this is going to be really bad for us. And so um, I said to my executive team, there's this place called Carbondale. Carbondale is in southern Illinois, three hours by car from Memphis. It's where they plan to open a new clinic in August. But we're reluctant to show us pictures because of security concerns. Clinician Nakia Grayson will be driving back and forth. Uh -huh. Will it be big enough to handle what is really going to be Mm. potentially a flood of patients, right? Now, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think that we will be the only clinic right now in the southern part of Illinois. We will handle as many patients as we can. In some states where abortion will still be legal, access is being expanded. Connecticut passed a law allowing non-physicians to provide abortions. But anti-abortion activists hope increasing support systems during pregnancy will change people's minds. I don't know of anybody that is, or any state that is thinking that they can stop people from traveling to another state. We are going to have to just push even harder than we have been to encourage women to let their baby live and to seek out the resources that are available. But for many of those who choose not to, getting an abortion just got a whole lot harder. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, Memphis, Tennessee. And we thank Stephanie for that report. In states like North Dakota, those, quote, trigger laws are expected to go into effect and completely ban abortion in 30 days. Now, the only abortion clinic in that state from Red River Women's Clinic is continuing to provide abortions until it is illegal. Then it's set to move to Minnesota. The head nurse of that clinic, Sarah Hader, joins Top Story again. And Sarah, first I have to ask, how are you doing? Um, not well. Just trying to hold it together. When you heard of this decision this morning, and you had to have been expecting it for weeks after that draft was leaked. What went through your head? Um, that our patients, anyone who can be pregnant in any of the states <laughs> surrounding us, but Minnesota, are going to have even more obstacles in front of them. So we know the clinic will be moving. What do you think that will mean for the women in North Dakota? And what will it mean for abortion providers in surrounding states? Sure. Well, um, you know, we had, we were inundated with calls from patients today just saying that um, they were wondering if abortion was still legal, if their appointment was still valid in North Dakota, were they going to be able to receive an abortion? Um, so the stigma and all of the politics are definitely adding to our patient's stress. Um, but what it means is that women of low income um, will not be able to access, access abortion care, safe and legal abortion care. 
And what have you been telling people who have been calling you? Um, we've been telling them that abortion is still legal and that we are going to be providing safe and legal abortion care until the state of North Dakota tells us that we cannot. You know, a few minutes ago, we spoke with um, an anti-abortion organization that, you know, is celebrating this decision that, you know, abortion will now be left up to the states. I I'm curious, what's your response to what she had to say? Well, um, they keep on saying that they are fighting for the fetus's life. We are going to continue to fight for women's lives. We will do whatever we can to make sure that women can still access safe and legal abortion. Um, if we have to help them with travel and child care and whatever they need to make it happen, we will. Um, but government mandated pregnancy are three words I never thought would be in the same sense. You know, I got the sense just listening to you, it's obviously a very emotional day. And I, is this just about reproductive rights or is it about much more? Um, that we have to practice someone else's moral beliefs. Um, we wonder what country are we in? You know, the United States was founded on the principle of separation of church and state. And these justices are practicing their religion in their um, judgments and in their opinions. And this should just not be allowed. That's the reason this country was founded. I should be able to practice no religion and you should be able to practice whatever religion you would like. But I should certainly should not have to um, continue a pregnancy just because you think that that is the morally sound choice. Sarah Hader, head nurse, thank you so much for joining us here on Top Story. And still ahead tonight, the other major headline from Washington, the House passing the most significant gun reform bill in decades. What happens next? And when can Americans start to see change? Plus, the exclusive interview with Ukrainian President Zelensky, what he told our Richard Engel about efforts to find and save two Americans captured by Russia. Stay with us. Back now with another major story tonight, the biggest changes to our nation's gun laws in nearly 30 years. Congress passing a bipartisan bill a little more than a month after the Uvalde school shooting. Garrett Hake joins us now from Capitol Hill. And Garrett, this breaks decades of congressional gridlock on guns. Walk us through what's in the bill and what happens next. Yeah, Gabe, I mean, it's, it's the biggest bill in 30 years, but it's really about a decade in the making. After the Sandy Hook shooting, you had Chris Murphy, the Connecticut senator, really start to dig in and work on this issue. And it frankly took the massacre in Uvalde a little more than a month ago for him to have a proper negotiating partner on the other side, John Cornyn. The two of them form the core of the group that's been working on this bill for a little over a month. At its centerpiece is something that, you know, would hopefully address the unique circumstances around the Uvalde shooting and the Buffalo shooting shooting before that, these enhanced background checks for gun buyers between the ages of 18 and 21. The idea here is that those gun buyers don't just pop into existence in terms of background checks on the day they turn 18. That's a big piece of this. The other big piece of these incentives to set up red flag laws around the country. There are 19 states that have extreme risk protection orders of some kind where a judge could intervene and take guns out of the hands of dangerous individuals. They would like to increase that number. They can't force states to do it. And so they've tried to incentivize it. And then there's really the carrot for Republican votes in particular. That's about a $7 billion investment in mental health services. Republicans who haven't wanted to look at this as a guns issue, have wanted to talk about it as a mental health issue, got what they wanted in this bill. That was critical to lining up Mitch McConnell's support, the minority leader, and with him came a host of other Republicans. So what we saw late last night, 15 Republican senators joining with all 50 Democrats to pass this bill and what was an emotional vote with gun violence victims and advocates in the gallery watching. And then today, the House following suit with only 14 House Republicans joining uh, all congressional Democrats to vote in favor of this bill. Though, Gabe, it was interesting to note you had 
the Republican members who represent both Buffalo and Uvalde among that number uh, voting to send this bill to the president's desk. And Garrett, let's take a step back here. This guns bill was expected to be the big headline of the day. And then, of course, the Supreme Court decision came down. How much has the focus shifted on the Hill and how remarkable was that? Almost entirely. I mean, lawmakers finished up, particularly in the Senate last night, a lot of these folks went home thinking they would be going back to their district and starting to campaign on this legislation. But in a moment, when that Supreme Court decision came out today, this issue shifted to the back burner. It made for some awkward moments today with House Democrats passing the bill this morning, or this afternoon, rather, and then trying to still hold some events around taking credit for it. Uh, you know, you, for example, we don't see the White House having a major signing ceremony today. It just doesn't fit in the moment. But, you know, for, for lawmakers who have been stuck on nothing on this issue for so long, I do expect to see, you know, the bells and whistles of a proper signing ceremony at some point. And lawmakers going out and trying to campaign on this, Democratic uh, activists in particular, have demanded this legislation. And in a rare moment, Congress broke the gridlock to deliver it. Uh, these are not folks who like to undersell their accomplishments, Gabe. So I suspect uh, those days will come soon enough. Garrett Haig on Capitol Hill. Garrett, thank you. Turning now to an NBC News exclusive. Ukrainian President Zelensky speaking publicly about those two captured Americans and his worries about the ongoing war in his country. Our chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, sat down with him. We met President Volodymyr Zelensky in his office. Good to see you again. While he makes many appearances, he does few interviews. Two Americans answered your call, as, as many did, to come here and fight for Ukraine's democracy. They were captured. The Kremlin won't rule out that they could face the death penalty. Is there something you would like to say directly to the families of those two Americans? They are heroes. And for me, they are the same like Ukrainians because they give and they gave the, the main things they had, their lives their lives, but I'm sure that we'll fight for them and we'll get them back. And of course, they will come back to, to your families, to, to their children. We spoke just moments after Ukrainian troops under heavy Russian fire for weeks were forced to withdraw from the city of Severodonetsk in the east, giving Russia a new strategic foothold. It seems like there's small advances from each side uh, every day and huge numbers of casualties. Can, can you continue in this? How do you change the stalemate? Their military outnumbers ours by 10 to 1. No matter how strong we are, they outnumber us by 10 to 1. It is very difficult. Are you worried that the West will lose interest in Ukraine, become exhausted uh, from this war, focus on other things, and that you'll be increasingly isolated over time? I am worried about this thing indeed. The war has no boundaries. The war is currently happening in Ukraine. But that means that the war is happening everywhere in the world. I'm sure about that. Gabe, President Zelensky thanked the United States and President Biden directly for the weapons he's received so far, but said he needs a lot more. And he said his intelligence services are working to free those two Americans and others held by Russia. Gabe? Richard Engel in Ukraine. Richard, thanks so much. When we come back, the courtroom attack. The father lunging at the man accused of murdering his young son. What happened next? Stay with us. Back now with Top Stories news feed, starting with the attack inside a courtroom in Columbus, Ohio. New video shows the moment a father lunges at a suspect accused of killing his son. The father punching a man a few times before he's restrained by officer. The suspect is accused of stabbing a 29-year-old woman to death and then throwing her young son into the Ohio River. He's facing the death penalty. Now to the manhunt for an escaped inmate in Alabama. Authorities say Philip Bradford escaped police custody Wednesday at a Birmingham hospital after overpowering a deputy and stealing an ambulance. Police say he was last spotted stealing a silver 2004 GMC Envoy at a Walmart along with an unidentified woman. He's facing several charges, including first degree robbery. Anyone who sees him is asked to call police immediately. Turning now to the Americas, where turmoil continues in Ecuador. 
For more than a week, protests in the nation have turned deadly as demonstrators protest soaring inflation. The country's capital virtually paralyzed as clashes with police intensify. NBC's George Solis has the latest. Panic has replaced peace on the streets of Ecuador's capital. Quito, a city of two million, now virtually at a standstill as violent clashes between protesters, police and soldiers continue into their second week. Today, demonstrators have set fire to tires, creating a haze in the midst of the chaos. Thousands of protesters supporting indigenous groups are demanding gasoline prices be cut by 45 cents to $2.10 a gallon, similar price controls on food products, and a larger budget for education. Hay que decir también a las autoridades del Cantón Quito, aquí nosotros no entramos a hacer vandalismo. Con la figura y con la estrategia de los últimos años, han instalado el, medio, el miedo en la ciudad de Quito. So far, attempts at negotiation have failed, and with each passing day, tension grows. No a la violencia, por favor, no a la violencia. No to the violence could be heard in one video shared online as riot police fired tear gas at demonstrators. The country's president, Guillermo Lasso, spoke days before contracting COVID-19, further complicating negotiation efforts. He's attacked the indigenous groups leading the demonstrations. Late today, the country's president called the violence an attempted coup. Está comprobado que la intención verdadera de los violentos es generar un golpe de Estado. Y por eso hacemos un llamado a la comunidad internacional para advertir de este intento de desestabilizar la democracia en el Ecuador. The indigenous groups have distanced themselves from the looting and destruction of property. Since the protests began, three people have died and hundreds have been injured. Nosotros seguimos haciendo el llamado al diálogo, a la sensatez, a la racionalidad, y sabemos que hay algunos grupos que están organizados tratando de generar caos en la ciudad. Demonstrators have said they refuse to negotiate until the show of force by the government stops. The UN and EU have urged both sides to come to an agreement as the U.S. State Department urges visitors to reconsider travel as violent clashes continue. And police tonight are saying protesters broke into the Egyptian embassy in Quito. There they do say they have the situation under control. In a tweet, authorities saying they do have computer servers in that building. And tonight, some lawmakers are also calling for the removal of President Guillermo Lasso, though other legislators say they will not go along with that plan. Gabe? George Solis, thanks so much. Coming up, the dire warning from the U.N. Officials saying multiple famines could begin this year. What's driving the global food crisis next? Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the U.N. accusing Israel of killing an Al Jazeera reporter in the West Bank. The world body saying Israeli forces shot and killed Shireen Abu Akla on May 11th while she was reporting near a firefight between Israelis and Palestinians. Israel maintain maintains it's still too early to determine who was at fault. And the U.N. is also warning of a catastrophic global food shortage following the ongoing war in Ukraine. Secretary General Antonio Guterres warning multiple famines could occur this year. The ongoing war added to food disruptions already fueled by several other factors, including climate change and the pandemic. When we come back, a historic day in America and the reaction across the nation. Finally tonight, outrage alongside celebration. The deep divide in America on this historic day. <laughs> I am pissed off and I am angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Abortion is not a constitutional right. Abortion is wrong. Deep sadness. That baby's a human life, and there are families out there that need those children. This decision does not end abortions, but it makes them far more dangerous. This decision must not stand! Every child, no matter how far along the mother is, deserves a chance. It sets health care back 50 years. Uh, God has fearfully and wonderfully made us uh, with a purpose for everybody's life. I'm heartbroken for this country, and I'm so embarrassed. It will save millions of lives of unborn children. 
They took away a constitutional right for half of the people in this country. has struck down Roe versus Wade. Reproductive health care is a human right. Life, life, life. That's what it's all about. And that is what I'm going to fight for until the day that I die. We did it! What on earth have we come to? What on earth are they thinking? We cannot leave our children with fewer rights than their mothers and their grandmothers. Strong passions on both sides. For Tom Yamas, I'm Gabe Gutierrez in New York. Stay right there. More news now is on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.